works. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to pick up in some ways where Soren left off. I'm going to be talking about a lot of the same topics, but I'm going to be looking through a different lens, which is a sociological lens, and to some degree a lens which has been following the bloggers, a lot of the emergent bloggers in Cuba, and I've tried in this research to really go beyond the tip of the iceberg. The tip of the iceberg, uh, as many of us know, is, uh, is, is Yoni Sanchez, the most well-known Cuban blogger, and probably one of the leading dissident uh, or the critical Cuban bloggers. But I'd like to, in this presentation, try to share with you uh, a broader uh, survey and analysis of the blogosphere and some of the various points along the blogosphere, um, because I think that the, the, the uh, people who stand outside of the government, who are agnostics, you could say, to the revolution, don't believe in it, have one effect and, and start one kind of debate and dialogue. But just as important, and perhaps more important within the island, are uh, subjects, in this case bloggers, who position themselves uh, strategically or because of their beliefs within the revolution, and from that standpoint, make criticisms. So that's what I'm going to be looking at. And I'm going to be looking at this in the, in the frame of the battle over public space and uh, the concept that we saw a lot of yesterday of civil society. This paper I worked on together with a graduate student, um, um, uh, Shame uh, Vandervoort. And so I want to begin with a quote, and this quote comes from the new vice president of Cuba. And this quote is, today the development of information technology, social networks, computers, and the internet to prohibit something is nearly an impossible chimera. It makes no sense. And so this comes in the context just before the Cuban government announced uh, a new quote-unquote public access to the internet uh, in, 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 in earlier in the summer uh, under, the under the title and actually the, the interface NAUTA. This is the actual kind of brand name of the internet access points that have around Cuba. Um, as part of the un, uh, un unveiling of a series of, of economic and now some civic and, and social reforms, including the, um, the change in the migration rules and also the, um, the, the, the issuing of term limits. So the issuing of um, these public access points is of a piece with that in the sense that it is significant but I would argue insufficient, and, and, and the NAUTA uh, kind of, the NAUTA frame, the, the, the internet cafes is a good symbol of that, and I'll get to that. So that's why I call it from NADA to NAUTA. The groups that I'm, I'm looking at, and I've been looking and following these groups for probably the last four or five years as they've emerged and, and, and kind of taken a space in the public debate are uh, the Voces Cubanas group that is the most well-known internationally and um, most prominently, Yoani Sanchez is the kind of main blogger and evangelist in many ways of that group. Havana Times is a group that was started by an American expatriate who lived in Cuba and worked as a translator for a number of years. Um, he actually is now back in Nicaragua um, because he lost his job in Cuba uh, under kind of sus suspicious circumstances. Um, but he does continue to edit the Havana Times portal. It's a bilingual portal in English and Spanish, and is made up, or the content is written by Cubans, uh, almost all of whom live in the island, mostly young Cubans, critical, but they're kind of a broad spectrum. Some are critical left, like our friend uh, Armando Chaguacera, who's here today, this morning, um, and some are more, uh, let's say, classically liberal, um, but they um, are independent largely, and therefore often taken into cri for criticism, but they survive and they continue to publish. Bloggers Cuba is a group that um, no longer exists really, but the most as a group, but the number of the bloggers still continue to um, blog, and um, Elaine Diaz, who has a blog called La Polemica Digital, is the main kind of well-known, most well-known person in that group. And then the La Joven Cuba group, I would call the most uh, uh, um, revolutionary, most pro-regime, the most staunchly defensive of the revolution, um, but they've also had some interesting battles with uh, uh, Cuban officialdom. They were actually closed down last year and then allowed to reopen. 
And so that story is also very instructive about some of the internal battles that are going on over public space, over permission, over independent civil society projects, regardless of whether they are within or uh, without or outside the revolution, going back to Fidel Castro's infamous declaration in 1961, uh, words to the intellectuals. Um, those words to the intellectuals lead me to the next uh, two um, the two points, um, and I mentioned this in my very opening of the conference, the idea that you know, having people and having dialogue between different, differently positioned people um, in the Cuban debate is often reduced to a polarizing shouting match between people who accuse one another of being oficialistas or mercenarios. Uh, I, I translate oficialistas as a Cuban government propagandist and a mercenario as a U.S. government lackey. And so to, to kind of bulldoze the rich terrain, and in this case emerging terrain of civil society, and place people in these camps is actually a very effective uh, strategy for the government because it allows them to you know, control, isolate, and delegitimize de uh, various actors. And I think that that was born in 1961 with words to the intellectuals. But that idea, and I quote that in my paper, because that idea continues to be uh, a method that the government tries to squelch this independent public debate. And, and when I say independent, I don't mean necessarily people who are who self-define as dissidents. I mean people who have independent criteria, whether or not they consider themselves socialist, uh, liberal, dissident, uh, Marxist, etc. So what are the challenges that these bloggers face? Here's a list quickly of the challenges, and when I interviewed a number of them, I tried to get their take on this, and as I observed them develop over time, I also look at these issues. How to resolve the conflict between self-preservation and self-censorship. This is the old, uh, the old Cuban, very common uh, problem of the doble moral. When, when and where do you say what you believe, and is what you say really what you believe or what you can get away with saying? And on, in the blogosphere, this is always a question that I ask, reading between the lines. How to preserve an independent and critical posture toward Cuban reality in a context where the mass media is under government control? Right, and this is a big issue that I also get to in the last issue about uh, visibility for these bloggers. How do they get their ideas out and get debate uh, and engage in debate? How to access the internet? That's a huge issue. And who can revoke your access to the internet and under what conditions? Is the price you pay for the internet economic or is it ideological? Or do you have some independent, quote, access to the internet? Who is your audience? Who is your intended audience? Who's your actual audience? And then finally, what have been the biggest obstacles to engaging in this dialogue? Yesterday we had a very rich, sometimes heated, but I think very productive debate about civil society and actors in Cuban civil society participated. Well, can those kind of things happen in Cuba given you know, the mass media control and also given the very low rate of internet access? And so, what are the obstacles to engaging in dialogue, debate, and collaboration? Do bloggers know about one another? Do they understand one another? Or do they simply know about one another from the caricatures that are often um, you know, fed to them um, in the media, in the, in the uh, mass media? And this relates to another idea that I really like to quote because it captures this strategy of the government to try to control public space while it has seated sometimes because it was very flat-footed and ignorant at the beginning, it has seeded cyberspace, at least in the beginning. And so this old uh, expression, bajo techo todo, en la calle nada, which we can unpack to say that, you know, criticism voiced in private are permitted to some degree, but the street belongs to Fidel. The street is understood as revolutionary space. Uh, this also relates to the old um, you know, slogan that, you know, la, la universidad es para revolucionarios. You know, the university is only for revolutionaries, right? Um, and uh, um, Bert Hoffman in Germany and uh, Maria Laure, Joffre in France have done some really interesting work on these questions. Joffre um, has said that this really translate, 
as the unspoken rule that criticism should be voiced inside institutions and directly to the authorities in charge, but not publicly. La ropa sucia se lava en casa is another way it has been saying. You wash your dirty clothes at home. So how do I define civil society when I try to understand this? This is a, a great, I think, packaging or understanding of civil society that Arolo Dilla, uh, the Cuban um, sociologist, and Philip Oxhorn um, put out about 10 years ago, and I think it's really useful because it, it doesn't simply define civil society, which is often maybe the U.S. State Department. I know we have some people from the U.S. State Department at the conference, but the U.S. government often takes the easy route and understands civil society as the dissidents or the opposition. When uh, a more nuanced uh, and I think accurate understanding, uh, it would be this. The social fabric formed by a multiplicity of self-constituted territorial-based units which peacefully coexist and collectively resist subordination to the state at the same time that they demand inclusion into the national and international political structures. And so there are a lot of pieces to that definition that I think help us understand it as more than the opposition, but there are certain things peacefully coexist, okay, resist subordination, so they demand, they demand inclusion, they resist, or they, they fight against being subordinated, they want their independence, their autonomy, and they fight for that, okay. The issue of territorially based is also an important issue, although I think in a growing and increasingly transnational world, in transnational Cuban context, I would argue that that part of the definition maybe needs to be rethought. Because what does it mean in the Cuban context, and especially if we're talking about the internet, which is by definition uh, beyond a, a certain territory, or goes beyond or traverses territories, what does it mean to be territorially based? And when you have a huge and influential Cuban diaspora, this is also, is the Cuban diaspora part of civil society? And if so, in which way? Geoffrey, who I mentioned before, looked at, you know, went back to the mid-2000s, really before the emergence of blogs and the internet had, had any impact on civil society, and she identified these four different groups that she could kind of clearly identify within this civil society, this proto-civil society. A dissident arena, a critical arena, which was largely within state institutions, sometimes voiced through elite academic publications like Temas or Criterios, a contentious arena, which you could kind of think about as a, a, a kind of a, a intellectual por cuenta propia, people who were contentious, who often were outside of um, uh, official circles, of state institutions, self-educated artists, marginalized intellectuals, who continue to insist on being included in debates and participate in those debates. Um, and then finally, the diasporic part of this arena, um, and she identified, uh, and I think this is a, you know, a fairly a, a good example, a good example of one of these, um, you know, is, is, is one of these diasporic um, publics it was uh, represented by the journal Encuentro de la Cultura Cubana, which is no longer published, but the group that published that kind of divided in two and now runs these two different websites, Encuentro en la Red and Diario de Cuba, which are a big part of this. And I'd say that's further fractured over the next six to eight years with the emergence of the blogosphere. And of course, that blogosphere is spread across all four of these groups. It doesn't, it's not contained in any one of them. And so that's kind of what's happened since the mid-2000s. Just a, a couple slides here that just will give you a little bit of information about the lay of the land in terms of internet access penetration in Cuba. This is why I, why I get the nada, nada to nauta idea. So, so there's good news and there's bad news, okay? Um, and depending on the spin and the statistics that you want to trust, um, you, can, you can look at that. The government claims that 23.2% of the island's population has access to the internet. But the government also um, you know, overlooks, sometimes admits that that access is if, it includes anyone who used email once in a year. Uh, it also largely is contained into what is known as the domestic internet or the intranet, which is a very limited version of the internet that exists in Cuba. So that's where that number comes from, and that number grew uh, in the last 
um, statistical re report, I think up to about 25 or 26 percent. Okay, but if you ask Freedom House, which uses a very different criteria, um, you'll get just three to five percent of the people have access to the internet or to the web as we know it um, outside of Cuba. Um, how do those people get access? Workplaces, schools, hotels, and there's a huge internet black market in Cuba. This has changed slightly over the last two months since NAUTA was inaugurated. Cell phone growth has been very important uh, because you have, uh, 10 years ago roughly, just 22,000 cell phones. Today we have 1.5 million cell phones in Cuba. So there's been an explosive growth of cell phones in Cuba. However, it's still important to, to note that even with this explosive exponential really growth of cell phones in Cuba, the lowering of the prices of the plans, even though they're very expensive still relative to Cuban wages, is that Cuba still ranks uh, the lowest access to cell phones in the whole Western Hemisphere. So even though there's been great growth, it, it's still very low compared to the rest of, of, of Latin America. So NAUTA, what is this new fangled uh, internet cafe? Um, someone wants uh, Nick Miroff, uh, a great reporter uh, who follows Cuba very closely, who lives in Cuba, he said that these are internet cafes without the internet and without the cafe. Um, he was actually referring to the internet about a year ago, so maybe they actually have a little cafe and a little internet at these internet cafes. But um, on June 4th, 2013, these uh, were inaugurated. What are the what are the positives? Well, there's a public access point to the internet that you can pay and you can go online. Although there are some sites that have been reported to be blocked, there's also access to sites that, you know, um, are very critical of the Cuban government, but also sites that, um, with general international news. Um, what are the downsides? The big downside that you hear mostly from Cubans is the price. Uh, one hour of internet access in these, uh, in these cafes is the equivalent of one week's salary, five dollars. Um, four, four, four fifty a cook, or five dollars. There's only 334 computers and 118 access points across the island. And so that may, it's been promised that that will grow, and all the photos that you see, they're the ones that have six or eight computers, but you know, if you have 118, and you divide up 334 computers, you know, um, you know, my, the computer lab at my university has more computers than that, right? And so, this is a start, but it's just a very small uh, and very, um, but I think the, the, real, the real issue here isn't all of this. Is this a smokescreen for trading in, okay, we're going to give you internet access, but you're going to give us the ability to watch you completely to engage in surveillance. And so, this is why I call it a walled garden meaning that the garden is owned and controlled by the Cuban government. It's a, monopoly, uh, it's a monopoly system, both economically, but it's also a system that requires users to sign an agreement that says that they won't engage in anything that undermines public safety or the country's integrity, economy, independence, or sovereignty. So it's kind of a lay mordasa or a gag law on this access to the internet. This is just the Cuban government statistics, and I highlight the, 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 the numbers that give you the 23.2% and the growth in the cell phones. These are the Freedom House statistics that simply, um, you know, the, 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 the takeaway is not free uh, in 2011 and 2012, okay, and the percentages are there in internet uh, uh, penetration and, and various uh, blockages, uh, people arrested, uh, all. all all of the answers to those questions are yes. And so this is an international survey that Freedom House does, and uh, Cuba um, you know, has one of the highest scores, and having a high score is not good um, in terms of access, in terms of freedom, okay? Um, so the, I think I'll end in my last couple minutes here with uh, a little story that it, it adds a wrinkle to this, okay? Over 2012, we had a number of interesting events that happened in the Cuban blogosphere. The first was, and uh, a pair of events, one called Blogazo por Cuba, okay? Um, the actual name of it was Encuentro de Blogueros Cubanos en Revolución. Um, and it was a gathering, a public gathering, at a, in a public, you know, the university, but it was by invitation only, 
And those who were invited, as the name implies, had to be bloggers who are in revolution. If you're not in revolution, then you weren't invited. Um, the other issue with this, this uh, event was um, one of the people who was not invited, who criticized the event, um, I quote Yasmin Portales, she says, who conducts the quote unquote revolutionary exam to give access to the internet in Cuba or to get invited to this event? The takeaway from this event, it was a gathering at the University of Matanzas put on by a blogging collective that I mentioned before called La Joven Cuba, Young Cuba. They basically say, um, to take away this, it is not possible to be a revolutionary outside the revolution, which is very reminiscent of Fidel Castro's words um, 50 years ago. So, so that's what you see kind of closing the circle. Observatorio Critico uh, came back uh, with this kind of attitude and they quoted the revolutionary socialist Rosa Luxemburg, giving credence to the argument that Chaguacela made yesterday that there are many kinds of socialism, right? And she says, freedom only for supporters of the government is not freedom at all. Freedom is only freedom if it applies to one who thinks differently. The other uh, festival of occupation of public space is known as Festival Click, the Click Festival. This was put on by Estado de Sats, who we heard from yesterday, uh, Voces Cubanas, and a Spanish blogging group called EBE. It took place uh, a couple months later, 300 people attended this. It took place at the Estado de Sats kind of headquarters, which also doubles as Antonio Rodiles' home in Miramar and Havana. And the, the, the argument or the takeaway, the distinguishing characteristic, this festival will not have a final declaration insulting anyone or engaging in character assassination, nor will they consider the web to be a battlefield against any other group or tendency. Of course, Cuba Debate, the uh, Cuban online um, newspaper that has very little debate, um, basically responded to this by saying that it was impossible that the Click Festival could be Inocente, and they wrote Inocencia in Spanish, highlighting the last three letters, hinting at who is really behind the, uh, the Click Festival. Okay? Um, the final thing that I'll say here relates to this picture. Okay? The group that actually sponsored the, uh, the Blogazo por Cuba uh, uh, gathering at the University of Matanzas was founded by these three guys. Not, not counting the older guy in the middle, who you probably recognize. But these three guys, about a, two months after they had this festival, which was attended by Mariela Castro, who declared at the event that the Cuban blogosphere is where the real news is reported. It is as Cuban as the palm trees. She tweeted that when she was at the event. Two months later, guess what happened to these guys? They were blockaded. They were kicked off the internet by the administrators of the University of, 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 of Matanzas, and they were not allowed to blog for the next six months. They actually put this in Spanish, this quote here, declaring that they were blockaded and hoping that common sense would prevail in the future on their blog. They managed to get someone to put it up on their blog, and it was there for a couple months. And so I said, what's the lesson? What's the takeaway? Even the most revolutionary voices and blogs can be silenced if they insist on editorial independence. However, however, in April of this year, after a meeting with Miguel diaz Canel, their blog was unblocked, showing some of the internal, you know, uh, struggles over public space within what is defined as within the revolution by revolutionaries. And they actually put this photo on their blog without any text except for the title that read Common Sense. I added the question mark. Okay, thank you very much.